Hi guys, welcome to the Simple Doesn't Mean Easy podcast. Today is a mini episode and it's actually being released on Good Friday. So I'm just going to dive right in. I'm going to read you a few pages from the book that I currently am reading. This is being recorded March 20th, so I'm still working my way through wanting to have this done in time for Easter. But I'm going to read to you from, let's see, the book is called Passionate About Passion Week by William Varner. And this is in one of the next to last chapters. Um, The chapter is called There Was No Mount Calvary. Sounds like an odd title, right? Um, Now I'm trying to find here. I wanted to just dive right in. I'm trying to find the page where I wanted to read. Maybe that's, no, that wasn't the chapter. It's actually the chapter, What Day Is It? Even a weirder title. Okay. In August of each year, the Jewish synagogue scripture reading from the prophets is taken from the book of Isaiah. On one Sabbath morning in August, the reading ends at Isaiah 55, just three verses before the end of that chapter. On the next Sabbath, the reading picks up at Isaiah 54, 1. Thus, Isaiah 52, 12 through 53, 12 is omitted from the reading of the prophets in the synagogue. This table of scripture readings has been well established since the early Middle Ages. Why is this section of Isaiah omitted from the synagogue readings? The typical answer from rabbis is that not every chapter of any prophet's book is chosen to be part of the readings. But such an answer simply isn't sufficient. Why is this particular passage omitted? And why in such an obvious way? Is it skipped over? Could it be that the rabbis simply do not want to expose their synagogue attendees to the contents of this chapter? Could it be that they're afraid of something? We will address this issue again, actually, in the epilogue. So we're not going to read that part today. But this chapter speaks in the clearest and most detailed way of the Messiah of Israel called the servant who was rejected by Israel but approved in God's plan as the means of salvation, atonement, and forgiveness for Israel and the whole world. According to Isaiah 52, 14 to 15, the Lord's servant not only suffers for the people of Israel, but as a result of his suffering and death, his blood will, quote, sprinkle many nations. Thus, the servant will be the savior of the Gentiles as well as the Jews. I can't think of any other passage other than Isaiah 53, that has been cited more by Jewish believers as the means that God used to bring them to faith in Jesus. This entire chapter is worthy of greater consideration, and we will do that again in the epilogue of this book. But I now desire to focus on something that is often overlooked, even by Christians. Verse 9 includes a fascinating statement about Jesus' burial. It says, And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. End of quote. Even though he was sinless, he died with wicked men. But the verse says more than that. It literally says his grave was appointed to be with wicked men, but he was with the rich man in his death. The word wicked in the first part of verse 9 is plural in the Hebrew. Reshem. But the word rich in the second part of the verse is singular in the Hebrew, Ashir. Why the plural wicked but a singular rich man? A brief look at the Roman practice of crucifixion, crucifixion, crucifixion. <laughs> sorry guys. Um, a brief look at the Roman practice of crucifixion will help to answer that question. Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22 are graphic, prophetic descriptions of this method of execution that the Romans borrowed from Carthage and then perfected to a gruesome art. People who were crucified were stripped of their clothes in shame and disgrace. Their hands and feet were pierced, and to hasten their death, sometimes the side was pierced. The amazing thing is that in the time of Isaiah, as well as the time when David wrote Psalm 22, of course, Crucifixion was not used as a method of execution with the Jewish people. 
It didn't appear, actually, as any method of execution until hundreds of years later, adopted by the Romans from Carthage, their enemies in the Punic War. Jewish people have always been very concerned about their burial. A body couldn't be left to die on a cross overnight and could not be buried with other people who were strangers. Reverent hands must take the body, wash it, anoint it, and bury it in a proper tomb. But victims of crucifixion often did not have those privileges. Their bodies were cast into a common grave with other bandits and revolutionaries who had also been crucified. There was an exception to that, partic- to that practice in Jesus' case. Joseph of Arimathea, a secret believer in the Lord Jesus, interceded for the family, and he requested his body. It tells us that in Luke chapter 23. Loving hands took the body of Jesus down from the cross. They wrapped him and they put him in the tomb, thus fulfilling Isaiah 53.9. How else can we explain but by the fulfillment of prophecy, this amazing statement that he was appointed to be with wicked men, but that he was with a rich man when he died? So, I took that a little out of context. You, of course, haven't read the whole book. So I hope that that was meaningful and gave you something to think about on this Good Friday. I hope you have a very blessed Easter and I will see you here on Monday. Thanks, guys.